Hey, hey everyone, welcome to Unique Ways with Thomas Gerard, an audio podcast. We've got a super awesome guest today. He's a Canadian designer of true type and open type computer fonts, and he owns Typodermic Fonts, which distributes commercially licensed and shareware freeware fonts. Please join me in welcoming Raymond Larrabee. Welcome, Raymond. Hi, Thomas, and hi, listeners. Nice to talk to you this fine morning in Japan. So, um, Listeners, there might be a slight delay when we're talking. So, you know, if we talk over each other, that's why. Awesome. Are you ready for 20 questions? I'm ready for 20 questions. Okay, here we go. Number one, tell me a little bit more about yourself. What do you do? I'm a full-time typeface designer from Canada, as you said. Uh, I've been making fonts for mm, 25 years now and been running typodermic fonts for 20 years. And I moved to Japan 15 years ago. Nice. Just to know for our listeners, um, Raymond and I don't know each other until now, but I know the name Larrabee from uh, my art school education. So uh, that's kind of how we ended up connected, I think. Oh, from, yeah, because, uh, you know, I released a lot of free fonts. Uh, so they get around. So a lot right. of people have heard of me from, from that. If you, you've heard of uh, back in the day, Larrabee fonts. And if you've ever downloaded anything from uh, free sites like Dafont, you've probably seen my fonts on there. Nice. Okay. Number two, what's a key piece of knowledge that makes you different? Mm, yeah. So I I entered the I entered type design from a weird angle because you know traditionally uh, to get into type design you had to be like into typography. You had to be a typographer first or a letterer generally. Uh, to get into it. In fact, when I was in, in school, I asked one of my teachers, you know, this is in the 80s, uh, you know, how do I, how do I get into it? Because I, I was really interested in getting into font design. This is before digital fonts were, uh, I'd have even heard of them. Um, and she said, no, well, you got to be a typographer first. And she was right. That's how it was back then. So I got into it from, from video game angle. So, you know, I grew up with uh, home computers in the early 80s, and uh, I got my first video game job in 86. So I was 16 years old, uh, 15, uh, 16, and I was going to, um, it, was a, it was a high school in Ottawa, it was like an art high school. Like you could take photography and that would count as science and take life drawing and count as something else, history or something. I don't know. So it's not around anymore, but it was an art high school. Um, and then, so this is, you know, there was a little bit of graphic design in there, just the basics. And then I went to classical animation in Oakville and I graduated that in 1991. And there's like no, no font stuff going on there. Um, I ended up in the video game business working on, uh, like NES, Game Boy, Super Nintendo. And I joined what became Rockstar Games and became art director. So well, yeah, how do how do fonts come into this? So just at night, I was kind of bored, and I picked up font software, and I was like, "Oh, I really like this," uh, and got right hooked right away. So I just got it. Look, like some people play games at night, I was making games in the daytime and making fonts at night, and really got into it. That's that's where all those free fonts came from. And then to get into uh, the full time business, I just quit my job, just started a full time font company. Nice. That's awesome. You're reminding me of the good old days with a uh, fontographer and, and, and then picking up font lab and, you know, making your handwriting into fonts and stuff like that, which was so kind of terrible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, when I made those early fonts, I really didn't know what I was doing. I was just slapping them together. Some of them turned out interesting. Some of them were awful. Um, some of them are really awful. Actually, on my uh, on my site, I released uh, hundreds, I think about two hundred uh, public domain fonts. So they're now in the public domain. So you know, you can you can do anything you want with them. Yeah, you can even uh, modify them and anything. So, yeah, some of those are pretty bad, and some of them are kind of charming. Nice. Um, number three, why this of all things? Why do you do what you do? Uh, so in the mid-70s, my grandmother was secretary at the 
uh, CMHC, that's Canada's National Housing Agency. And, uh, you know, they had a lot of architects and graphic designers working there, and they'd end up with these letter set sheets. Uh, letter set is like, uh, if you've ever seen these things, it's like dry transfer lettering. You rub your pencil on it to, uh, to put your lettering. And that's how lettering was done in the 70s, a lot of it anyway. Yeah. Uh, so they had, if they, I think the government policy was if they ran out of any letter, they had to throw away the sheet. Uh, and they were, back then it was like seven bucks a sheet for those, those fonts. Um, so I'd end up with all these sheets and sometimes there was only one letter missing, but I'd have stacks so I could, uh, and I'd play with those all the time and I'd learn the names of the fonts and I, I really got into, into it and I, was kind of wondering why the rest of the world doesn't understand when I talk about Univers or Clarendon and stuff like that. They don't know what I'm talking about. But I was really into it super young. And um, I was really into these wacky packages stickers. These were, um, they're still around. If you go to comic book shops, you can probably still find them in the trading card section. But they were um, parodies of products. So you'd have like a Coca-Cola and you'd have like a, funny name for it um and then i was fascinated by those and i draw my own and i really liked how i could take a logo that existed and i'd have to make up another letter because i'd have to you know if i'm making like joe coca-cola or something like that i'd need to make a j that matched the style of the coca-cola logo mm -hmm. so i really got into just making those for fun on my own and using my letter set sheets to add some of the lettering uh and i i really i think that part of you know if you look at my early fonts where I'm doing, uh, you know, like the KISS logo or ACDC, I would try to come up, you know, ACDC only exists as three letters and a lightning bolt. So I had to come up with, basically it's the same skill. It's like trying to think of, well, what kind of, what would a B look like? What would a Z look like in those, in that same font? Um, yeah, so that's really how I, how I got into it. I was just really hooked. And then when I was in these other in these other careers, I was always still interested in it. And you know, if I was doing a video game, I was the font guy. You know, I was the one doing the, the little pixel fonts and stuff like that. Nice. Uh, you know, I'm glad you're talking about Letraset. You're reminding me of the the Helvetica movie where Paula Scher is talking about trying to use Letraset and having it crackle and break, and then she ends up illustrating the type. <laughs> it was wor it was the worst when it got dust. Mm. If you got if you if you didn't put that uh, protective sheet in that, you got dust. It just wouldn't stick. Yeah. Awesome. Um, number four. What does your future look like? Well, um, I'm still a few years away from retirement, but I stopped doing custom work a few years ago. Uh, I'm just going to keep making fonts. You know, I like. I like playing with uh, new technologies that come out. I mean, the variable fonts thing uh, I've been into recently. I was kind of a little slow to catch on with that because I was uh, I didn't have I didn't update my software. So now I'm up to date and I'm uh, making variable fonts. And um, I'll probably probably do some stuff with AI. Last summer I experimented with AI just to produce ideas for fonts and actually came up with nothing but it kind of it kind of informed me on what not to make you know i figure if if ai in uh 2021 uh, 2022 was already capable of doing this kind of font maybe i shouldn't make those kind of fonts um but i'm, I'm really hoping that there will be ai to help just take the drudgery part of, of making fonts out i don't know if that'll happen but I don't want it to design the alphabet for me. I want it to, you know, fill in math symbols and, you know, stuff that I don't really want to do, like trying to figure out what a, you know, the, the Greek lowercase, some of it, it takes a long time to fill in some of this stuff that, that that's not the fun part of making fun. So, you know, playing with tools and stuff like that, trying to stay on top of things. Nice. Okay. Um, number five is a good one for you. Let's talk about location. How does the notion of place play into what you do? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, that is good. This is going to be a long one because I have to tell my a little bit of my life story. So until I was 16, I lived in rural Ontario in cottage country. I was very isolated. And, you know, I'd have friends for about two and a half months in the, the very short summer times we have. 
uh, when people come to their cottages, but the, the rest of the time, there's just no other kids around. Uh, so, and my, you know, the, the bus ride was, I'm the last person on the bus <laughs> during the bus ride from school. So I'm really far away from any of them. Uh, and there's no real easy way to hang out with people after. So I was kind of isolated, uh, which gave me time to get into hobbies, one of which was my computer. So I got like a TRS-80 uh, Radio Shack computer and uh, got really into it. I got into programming. I, I wanted to be a programmer, but I just don't have, I kind of hit a wall with math and program. like I could do it, but up to a certain level, I was just hitting a wall. It's like, I'm just not made to be a programmer, but I have the heart of a programmer. I really want to, <laughs> but uh, I couldn't. So, you know, I was playing with computers and playing with uh, making fonts on computers too. I was making, there was no way to distribute them, but you could get little programs that would let you make bitmap fonts and create graphics with it. Um, so, then I moved to Ottawa to go to art school. It was like a whole different world because now, yeah, I, you know, I didn't really click with a lot of people in the small town. It's, uh, you know, I don't care about hockey and snowmobiles and stuff like that. Um, I was very into Star Wars and geeky stuff. <laughs> so when I got to Ottawa, I was like, well, people are like me. You know, there's other weirdos here. It was an art school, so extra weird. Um, an art high school. So uh, then, you know, Mississauga, Oakville, Niagara Falls for about 15 years. And in that time, I started to type in fonts. Uh, and then, you know, I tried Vancouver and then moved to Japan and then I'm kind of isolated again. But it gave me more time to uh, work on fonts. So I've been creating a lot more since I moved to Japan. Um, and time zones really help, you know. In the mornings, I do my email, and then no new email comes in, you know, because most of the email is going to come from North America or Europe, and it's just stopped. So it's a really great way to concentrate during the day. You know, after noon, there's just nothing, no interruptions all the way to 5 o'clock. So I can just burn right through and, and really get into a flow state and concentrate on making it fun because there's just no interruption. The downside of that is I can't check email at night. Because all email starts to pour in about yeah, 9, 9 p.m. And I can't check any email because if there's a technical question in there, I'll be thinking about it all night or I have to solve it. Uh, you know, especially when it's uh, a problem with one of your old font. Uh, I'll just think about it and not sleep. So, um, And also, okay, Japan, techno culture, right? I make techno fonts and they have a special relationship with robots and technology and stuff like that. Uh, so one thing that really struck me when I first arrived and it really affected my designs was the, you know, the, if you think about North American techno fonts, it comes in phases. There was like a techno trend in the 70s and then in the 80s, and then it kind of went away for a while in the early 90s and so it was, came I was up and down and changed form whereas in Japan there's like an industrial techno design that just stuck around like it it doesn't go away it just stays there because it's part of their you know uh, industrial logo types and stuff like that so there's a real embrace of this industrial techno look in Japan that, that really struck me um you can kind of see it in, like, if you look at Toyota cars, especially older Toyotas, you can really see this kind of engineered style where it looks like maybe a typographer or letterer wasn't involved. It seems like the engineers designed it. There's a lot of that kind of stuff where, uh, like, like, there's some logos where you can see that, oh, I think this was the boss's niece drawing it on graph paper or something. Like, it's not, it's, there's something really charming and, and industrial about it. So, um, yeah, and, and also you, you get a kind of a different view of type here because you're just not seeing the same thing. I'm not overexposed to any specific font that I might be if I was still living in Canada. 
Nice. Um, yeah, quick note for our audience. If you're enjoying this episode, enjoying geeking out about type, check out the uh, high profile episode with Eric Speakerman. It's one of our most popular episodes. And um, that was really good. Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. Um, okay. Number six, if you uh, had to start from the beginning, how, uh, what advice would you give your former younger self? Ah, uh, well, you know what? I've created a lot of problems for myself. Like I, I've had to fix everything I've done. So, and it takes a long time, sometimes multiple times, because I'll, I'll keep learning new things and, and finding mistakes that I made. So I would say incorporating rigorous testing for technical issues. I know it's kind of not a very philosophical, interesting answer to the question, but literally um, that, that would change a lot. Because I would have to fix everything. You know, I would sometimes make a font. But in the early days, I would make a font, just launch it. I didn't even test it. <laughs> I was just putting them out there. Like, here you go. Here's your free font. Nice. Um, I think a lot of people did, too. Like, if you, you know, you look at new free fonts now, and there's a lot of really great quality. But if you actually saw what fonts were like in 1996, free fonts were like in 1996, they were barely useful. Like, it was very rare to find anything of even the basic quality that you could actually use it in a professional environment. Like, they were really rough. Uh, and if you look at my old fonts, that's not fair because I fixed them. Uh, if you actually tried the original ones, they'd probably crash your whole system. I don't know. That's not true. But they're, they're pretty rough. So that's what, I would, that's what I would change. Test everything with proper testing tools print them and make sure the line spacing is good you know all the stuff i have to do now um that, that would really help yeah nice yeah i was in art school in the 2000s and the only way you could get a legal free font that was actually usable was when like a big foundry would release like one weight of like one weird font yeah, for, yeah. and you could you could use that barely but you could uh, that was really the only way um, yeah. yeah. Um, number seven, what's a day in your life like? Okay, well, I told you I have to do all my email first thing in the morning because it's all there waiting for me, for the day's email. Uh, you know, I get some exercise. I walk the dogs. I do minimal exercise. I do the, the, the fit, fit uh, what is it called? Fit boxing, I think it's called. <laughs> I can't think of the name of it. Um, the boxing game on the, the Nintendo Switch. Um, so I do that. I work like I get in, like I said, I get in that flow state and I, um, I work really long. Sometimes I'll, I'll go after supper and go back in and, and just keep working. So especially if I'm doing something like kerning, that's kind of mindless and put some music on and just, uh, I don't know if you saw the video I put on Twitter recently, but I, I hooked up a, a super Nintendo controller and set it up so I can do kerning and just sit back in the chair with the controller. So uh, sometimes I'll put in a few hours that way. And then I play video games a lot. Um, you can, uh, you know, even though, yeah, I'm a geek. <laughs> I play, I don't play multiplayer games or anything like that. I like games with a story. I play a lot of RPGs, Pokemon. Or last year was all Pokemon. So much. i catching up. Um, yeah, a lot of video games. I don't watch much TV. I watch a little YouTube. But, uh, Games, games, games. Good stuff. Um, number eight, lifelong learning is a popular topic. How do you stay up to date? Uh, well, I read the newspaper on actual paper. It's nice to get away from the screen. New York yeah. Times, Japan Times. And uh, I, I go to type drawers. Type drawers is a place where all the font people go. Not all of them, but you know, generally you're going to find the the big players go there and talk about technical stuff and uh it's not super active because they're just not that, they're not that many font designers in the world you know considering other jobs it's pretty small um and i look at uh questions and answers on the font lab forum uh so that's mainly what i do I tr I'll, I'll get into that later like how yeah I'll, we'll talk talk about that later on another question more about that oh and um okay another thing i do is i get into 
kind of geeky subjects, if you haven't guessed uh, by now, listeners, but I won't get into, uh, okay, let's say uh, boom boxes. I'll get into that, just looking at pictures of boom boxes, and that will give me ideas for fonts, but not not necessarily, oh, I see, I saw a font on a boom box. Uh, here's an example. Okay. Um, I was walking down the street a few years ago and noticed, oh, wow, it's weird when you see a Hummer in Japan. Like people, It takes up like two lanes. <laughs> the streets are not that wide here, but you'll see someone with a Hummer that's imported. And um, I was thinking, well, what if a font could be a Hummer? So then I tried to, I made up this font called Rexlia, which has just the, the same qualities of the body shape of a Hummer. So a lot of times there'll be something that is totally unrelated to fonts, but some obscure thing that I can think, oh, maybe this could be useful as a design cue or something like that. Um, and then like retro retro gaming, uh, sci-fi book covers, old magazines, or just some random thing. Like, uh, okay, I'll pick one random. Soviet board games. I haven't looked that up yet, but I'm sure you can find something cool there. Um, and I, I really try to avoid reading too much typography related news. Like I, I want to know about technical stuff, but I don't want to uh, follow that too much. Like I do want to make sure my own work is unique enough by having these weird sources of input. Uh, I think that's really important. Nice. I like that. Um, so number nine, let's talk about tools. What tools do you use uh, these days? Are you digital and analog? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I use FontLab in Windows. I'm not a Mac person. I tried. It's like, you know, the you know Passage to India? I don't know if you read the book or watched the movie, but I just could never make the transition. I tried so many times. It's just I'm not, you know, when the Mac came out, I had a choice. I, my parents were like, which one do you want? Do you want the Commodore Amiga or do you want the Mac? I was like, oh, Amiga for sure, because I want to make animation and video games. Um, so I windows all the way and it kind of limits what tools I can use because I can't use glyphs and some other tools are not available. Um, I also use Font Creator and Font Bakery for testing. Font Creator is another tool and actually one that I, I often recommend to beginners mm -hmm. getting into it because it's it's so great but I'm so ingrained in FontLab that I can't change. It's like if you try to go to Corel Draw from, from Illustrator, it's too big a change if you use it every day. Um, even though they're probably just as good. Um, I don't know, I haven't used Corel Draw since the 90s, but um, yeah, uh, I use Adobe, uh, Adobe Suite for testing and for my promo graphics. Um, now, in your original uh, questions thing, you said, are you a digital nomad? Yeah, that's okay, right. I'll get into the analog thing. So I, I definitely am not. I don't feel comfortable using a laptop. <laughs> Uh, you know, I need my big monitor. I need my numberless keypad. I use numberless keyboard because I like to have a mouse really close to the side of the keyboard, and I don't want the number pad getting in the way. And I'd have like I I I am just hell on arrow keys. I used to trash keyboards so many times and, and like solder in new arrow keys because I I use a lot of arrow keys in my work. Um. So I finally got an optical, one of those optical gaming keyboards. They're amazing. There's no mechanical uh, connection when you press the keys. So they'll last a few million more keystrokes. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so, and I also like to be able to fix my computer if something goes wrong. It's just mm -hmm. that I don't feel comfortable like it could break and then I can't work. I, I like being able to just go and buy a motherboard and a hard drive and pop it right in myself. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, and also, the other thing, the other reason I don't like to use a laptop is because I probably could work on it, but I mean, nowadays, if you're doing a variable font, you've got, you know, sometimes I've got 16 or more masters in the same font with Cyrillic and uh, Greek and all these characters. It's really, you need a powerful computer now. Like, it's amazing how it'll chug right in. And I've got like a I don't play, I don't use my computer as a gaming system. I, I game on consoles, Switch and Xbox, but I could, like it is a high-end PC. Uh, and it, it just, even it bogs down. So 
you need a lot of power nowadays to, to be able to make variable fonts, I think. Nice. Okay. Halfway, number 10, how do you deal with work-life balance? Well, maybe I'm not a good example for that. I could be a, a cautionary tale. I, I really just focus on work. I don't take many days off, almost none. Um, you know, that's a trade-off I made in my career. Um, I missed my 20s because uh, the game companies are really intense. It's a real meat grinder. Uh, I don't know what it's like now, but uh, game companies in the 90s and early 2000s were kind of not very professional. <laughs> it was a bit of a gang mentality in a way. Uh, and it is it was very, very bad life balance just at work. And then I would go home and make fun. So um, I do try, you know what, lately I've been trying get out and do photography, uh, street photography. I have a little, uh, you know, primal lens GR, Rico GR, and I, I go out and do photography. And I, that's mostly what I put on, uh, on my uh, Twitter and Instagram. So that's what I've been doing lately, trying to uh, get out of the house. Nice. What, what part of Japan are you in? I'm in Nagoya. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It's the third largest city. Nice. And, and it's, uh, it's the culture is interesting in Nagoya because it's very, I, I, I'd say culturally, it's probably close to something like Cleveland, where it's a little bit self-deprecating. Like, we kind of know we're not cool. And we're <laughs> Nice. Um, number 11, if you weren't doing what you do now, what would you be doing? Oh, did we cut out? Hello, hello. I think we may have cut out here. Still some technical difficulties here. Hey guys, just fixing that technical glitch. So we're on number 11. If you weren't doing what you do now, what would you be doing? Hello, hello. Oh, I'm pausing again. Hey guys, we're back. Uh, number 11, if you weren't doing what you do now, what would you be doing? I think it'd be in advertising. Like, I, I feel like without fonts, I probably would have gravitated towards something like that. Like, either in graphic design sense or ad copy, uh, naming, that kind of thing. Like, I, I feel like I'm really attracted to that kind of thing. Nice. I know what that world's like. Um, number 12, what would you not like to do in terms of career? Uh, drive a taxi. <laughs> so I, I'm really bad at driving. Mm -hmm. uh, really bad. I'm very easily distracted. I get lost a lot. And especially, uh, you know, if I'm trying a video game with driving, I get lost. So it's a good reason I should not be driving a taxi. Nice. Um, 13... it, would be, it would be bad for everyone. <laughs> Um, 13, what's your favorite word, quote, or sentence? Okay, so when I quit my job, I, I said, a quitter always wins, just as a joke, uh, just, just to kind of make fun of it, the fact that I, and I, I, I did not quit my job in a nice way, I just walked out, I was really frustrated and just walked away, uh, so, you know, the original thing is by uh, NFL coach Vince Lombardi that said, quitters never win and winners never quit, but, so that's my, my twist on it is a quitter always wins. It's not always true, but that's that's my favorite quote. About a least favorite word quote or sentence. Yes. Everything happens for a reason. 
<laughs> because look, look, even if you if you just think about that, okay, you can find some things that don't happen for a reason, right? Like these two Doritos are stuck together, <laughs> right? So then, so what you're saying is some things happen for a reason. That's not a quote. But what are you? Some things, you know, doesn't make any. That one, that one's frustrating because all you have to do is just think about it, and it doesn't make any sense. If you had to pick one word to describe yourself, what word would you choose? Uh, toolmaker. That is one word. I had to look it up. It was like, is it hyphenated? It is not hyphenated. A toolmaker, because I'm making tools. You know, I'm I'm not designing. So you're, I'm basically making tools that I'm hoping someone will find useful. You know what I mean? Okay. Like you're just kind of guessing. If you're a graphic designer, you're solving problems. I'm trying to guess what problem someone might need to solve and making a tool so we'll be able to solve it. And sometimes it turns into a tool that nobody buys. And sometimes it's a tool I don't think will be very useful and that becomes a big hit. So uh, that's how I describe it, the tool maker. Nice, yeah. Just for the audience at the time of this recording, ChatGBT has uh, just kind of emerged and uh, people are trying to use that as a tool, I think. Yes. Um, Yes, well, I do. I do kind of cheat and use that in my ad copy a little bit. Um, Sixteen. What keeps you up at night? Ah, vertical metrics. Vertical oh. metrics are so that is the the settings for how high your ascender is, your descender, mm. caps height, all that kind of stuff. Um, it keeps me up at night because sometimes I'll I, I really will try to think about well, did I do this one wrong? Or a customer says one of their accents is getting cut off in uh, Word 2010 on a Mac. So there's all these different settings that, over the years, and they're all interpreted differently by uh, software engineers. Browsers will render the font a different way, even though the settings are the same on, on, on two different browsers on a different system. Uh, so around 2010 when I was when I joined uh, I put my fonts on Typekit which later became Adobe fonts they had a system so I made everything to work with that system and now they have a different system even though it's still Adobe fonts and that, that, so it means all of those thousands of fonts are wrong mm -hmm. but they still work okay but I have to do them a different way now and uh, that keeps me up at night it's it's uh yeah, it's frustrating. I like that. Ascenders and descenders. Okay, number 17, what's a dream you're chasing? Uh, well, I never chase my dreams. You know, I get interested in a thing. I pursue that. It leads me to another thing. Um, yeah, I don't I don't chase my dreams. So like, I remember when I worked at a, um, a department store, Bullco. It's not around anymore. It's like a Walmart kind of thing for you young folks. Uh I just wanted a job where I could sit. You know, it's like that was my dream. It's like I just want to be in a chair. You know, those kind of jobs, those kind of lousy jobs, really help you appreciate the, the little things. What inspires you? Uh, you know what? I, it's designers that creatively overcome challenging technical hurdles. You know, and that's kind of what attracted me to. Uh, video games in the first place like I really enjoyed the restrictions like you know I had to do a wrestling game WWF King of the Ring on uh, Game Boy and NES and the, the technical limitations are so severe so and when you design let's say you're designing a wrestler and there's the hair is kind of sticking out and it's using up another tile everything's broken into these tiles Um, you end up using one pixel on another tile, so you have to, and the programmer's like, hey, that's wasteful, and you have to go in and really optimize everything. Um, and, uh, like, the audience on one side of the ring has to be X-flipped, so they're mirrored on the other side. I, I really like those kind of technical things, and I'm really impressed when people do uh, designs and, and, and really limited media. Mm. Yeah, it really inspires me, and in a way, making fonts is really limited too. I mean, it's less limited now. You kind of have access to colors, but 
it's still very much vectors, black and white. Probably your capitals are probably going to be 700 units high, roughly. Um, yeah, it's, that's, that's what it inspires me. 19, any advice you'd like to share? Yeah, so this is what I was getting at earlier, is you want to find this gap between willful ignorance and like feeding from the design trough. Like if you're, if you're like, you don't want to completely ignore everything in your, your business. You know, I don't want to completely ignore all other fonts and uh, typography and stuff like that. But also if you're, all you're doing is looking at font catalogs and looking at new fonts and looking at uh, what typographers and type designers are doing, um, you're just going to create the same thing. And the, I think when you look at where we're headed with AI, um, our value is how we're not like machines. And if you're, you know, you're going on uh, Pinterest and looking at design blogs and stuff like that all the time, uh, you're you're just going to output the same material everyone else is going to. So you have to you look for, just be weird and go down weird channels that no one else has thought of. Uh, to make sure your designs are completely original. And not just that, to discover things no one's discovered yet. Awesome. And uh, finally, how can our listeners keep tabs on you? You know, you're in Japan. What should we do? How do we, uh, how do we catch up with you? Well, you know, I'm on Twitter all the time. Mostly my photos on Twitter, but if I have any new font uh, launches, they're going to be on there. So it's Typodermic on Twitter and Tumblr and our Larrabee on Instagram. And my fonts are at typodermicfonts.com, and you can find free fonts there. Uh, if you look at the news archive, you'll find a zip with all my old public domain fonts if you want to experiment with them and try making your own stuff out of them. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a real pleasure. I love talking about type. And, uh, and yeah, um, Ray Larrabee from Japan. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. It was great talking with you.